Yes, please. Well, um, to the graduating class of 2020, congratulations. Tonight you find yourself standing on the pinnacle of your educational pyramid. And really what an accomplishment this is. All of you have demonstrated an incredible track record of sustained achievement from success in undergrad studies to achieving a position in medical school to continuing a level of excellence in order to have matched in emergency medicine. Being one of the most desired specialties in all of medicine, I remind you that during your application year, there were over 800 applications for your 14 positions. And yet, here you are. Then emergency medicine residency. It uh, is without a doubt the hottest, most intense academic crucible possible. The workload is uh, unimaginable to most. The, man, the demands on your personal time, yours, your significant others, your families, your friends, are nearly incomprehensible and quite frankly, would be unacceptable to most. The learning curve begins at an early vertical slope and rarely lets up. And during the forging of this new you, there really is no hiding. One of the essential beauties of emergency medicine is the egalitarianism of its practice. It is interactive with each other at a level that few, if any, specialties or careers can equal. It is intense, it is fast-paced, with extraordinarily complex decision-making based on partial information. There are profound consequences resulting from our actions. In such an arena, no one can hide weaknesses, faults, or personality traits. Conversely, this arena provides opportunities to demonstrate strengths, judgment, decision-making, and work ethic. It's no wonder we become so invested in each other. But every end is a beginning. Now begins the next phase in your life, both personally and professionally. The question is, what are you going to do with it? After all, you're now where you wanted to be so many years ago. I was very kindly asked to speak to you all on this most important of days. In looking for quote unquote words of wisdom, I was struck how consistent the themes are year after year, how we keep coming back to the same truths um, as noted by Robert Frost in his poem, The Black Cottage. Most of the change we think we see in life is due to truths being in and out of favor. As I sit here and oftentimes I wish I could be monarch of a desert land, I could devote and dedicate forever to the truths we come, keep coming back and back to. Bear with me as I offered some distilled observations, advice, and maybe even a pearl or two of wisdom. You're going to be the new kid on the block. Many of you will have far less experience than the people around you. However, realize that you bring a lot to the table, a fresh and complete knowledge base, the most updated literature. Particularly in the community, it's difficult to stay updated and some of the practice around you will seem old or even archaic. Don't be surprised when you're asked about the most current practices or your opinions. Also realize that you'll be among the most adept at many procedures, especially ultrasound. Some say that the first year of practice will be the steepest learning curve of your life. There are going to be a lot of times that you don't have the right answer or know what to do. That's a given. It will not be unusual to feel overwhelmed and even scared at times. Don't be afraid to ask questions. The experienced nurses are usually right, but not always. Listen to them, but don't let them talk you out of what you know is right. If you need to transfer a patient, don't ever be bullied out of one by the accepting hospital or doctor. Chances are you're correct. When in doubt, think back to a favorite attending and ask, what would they do in this situation? I can say for many years that I would ask myself what my mentor would do. What would Mary Hughes do in this case? When the shit hits the fan, take care of the sick ones first. Everything else follows. Always trust your spidey sense. Don't let people doing what you think is right. And don't, don't ever forget the sleep test. Always do the workup that will allow you to sleep well at night. Fear the elderly, scan them a lot. Don't cone down too early. Work up your patients thoroughly, not just the minimum to get a disposition. 
this will slow down your throughput at first, but it builds your clinical acumen and consultants respect it. Then when you have a soft admit or a puzzling case, they're much less likely to push back because they know you do solid work. It's far too easy to fixate on a diagnosis too early, especially if symptoms and signs are subtle. Take this, multiply it by 10 with intoxicated patients, which I think some of you have seen in our department, and at least 100 with psychiatric patients. A lot of medical maladies come in masquerading as psychiatric disorders. If you're debating ordering a test or doing a procedure, do it. One of the most successful skills to cultivate is touching base with the nurses after seeing a patient. Just set out the plan, a timeline, and expectations. They feel like they're in the loop, they know your thoughts, and you can walk away knowing that things will be put into action without them nagging you, nagging you or you nagging them. I always think of Dr. Bayless when I say, be your patient's biggest advocate. You know that many forces will resist your patient and their care being prioritized. If going into community medicine, it's rare to get a consultant to actually come in and see a patient at night. The first few years, this can be really scary and these can be very, very sick patients. Try to maximize care of the critically ill patients late at night and save those times when you demand a consultant to come in and see the patient for those with true surgical emergencies or those really circling the drain. Importantly, know that we all make mistakes and learn how to forgive yourself. When you call a consultant, introduce yourself and tell them that you are, quote, sorry to bother them, but you have a patient that needs their expertise, rather than telling them, telling them that you have, have an admit for them. This will carry you far, especially if you plan on staying in one location for a long period of time. But if push truly comes to shove, politely don't back down or they will walk all over you. I found this to be especially true in the community hospital setting where they really hate having their routine disrupted. That being said, there are practice variations, so be open to differing practice styles in different locations that may be acceptable, but not to what you've experienced up to this time. That will not be infrequent. There's always one consultant or hospitalist who's unhappy or angry all the time. Don't let them ruin your day. Their unhappiness is their problem. When calling someone, quickly get to the punchline, especially in the community. I have an XYZ that is this, that, or whatever. If you give a medical student style presentation, the consultant is developing their own plan the entire time you're talking, which may differ from yours, now perhaps putting you at odds. Let them know up front where this is going to be headed. Emergency medicine is a really dynamic field right now, particularly with COVID. This may not be what you wanna hear, but it's unlikely that you're going to be working in the same shop in five years that you started after graduation. Get a second or part-time job. This will allow you flexibility should something happen, provide you a little bit of extra out income, and also let you explore different types of emergency medicine practice that you may not know existed. Financially, your life should be looking quite a bit better here in the near future. Make a budget, even if it's a, a hazy one, and make a plan to pay off your debt and stick to it. I recommend getting a good accountant. Always start an emergency fund that will cover six months of expenses. Take X percent of every paycheck that you will need to go into taxes and always, always, always overestimate this one. A classmate of mine in residency didn't take out the proper amount of taxes and had to charge uh, a five figure amount onto credit cards to pay the IRS. Very painful. Estimate paying off your loans in whatever number of years, then use an amortization calculator to figure out how much you have to pay each month and stick to it. Overpay if you can, get out of debt. Put as much of your retirement in, or earnings into uh, retirement as possible. And then uh, after that, look at housing, travel and leisure from there on. And don't budget based off of bonuses. They're never guaranteed. Again, probably not what you wanna hear, but live below your means. You will appreciate it later. The first couple of years, don't buy the fancy car, don't buy the big new house, except that you're not rich and set your expectations to live that way. It'll be extremely tempting to quote, just pick up a couple of extra shifts to fund the nice things, and I've done that. 
but one day you look up and realize you're burned out, need to back off the pace, but because you've got payments to make, you can't. Live small at first. The White Coat Investor is a great resource, both the blog and the book. Get and keep a good disability policy. Travel whenever you can, visit everyone you miss. Also remember that time in residency has been stressful for friends and family as well. This is the delayed gratification that both you and they have been waiting for. Ensure that they have access to your time as well. Very important. Lastly, be kind, be honest, work hard, trust your training, and always do the right thing. Graduation is bittersweet for myself and all the other members of the residency. We see extremely capable, well-trained emergency physicians leaving to go out in the world to succeed and make a difference. But we also see colleagues, friends, and parts of us leaving us as well. Everyone, please join me in a toast to the graduating emergency physicians of 2020. Oh. Cheers. 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 Congrats. Congrats. And thank you for including me and congratulations. Thank you.